Our final segment of the evening is a grand finale indeed, legendary leader. The spirit of this award is couldn't have done it without you. And please welcome uh, our always good friend, John Walsh of Accenture to introduce. Thank you, Rich. Um, and thank all of you for, uh, for coming tonight. Before I start, uh, I'd like to ask all of you to join me in thanking Karen Tucker and the Churchill Club for putting on such fantastic events as this one. Accenture is proud to be involved as we deeply resonate with the themes of these awards, as well as the broader Churchill Club charter, which you mentioned in your opening tonight, what's new, what's next, and what's, uh, what's not widely known. I almost forgot it. <clears throat> tonight, it is my privilege uh, to present the Legendary Leader Award. The Legendary Leader Award is about inspirational leadership and contributions to others' innovation and success. When the Churchill Club asked its academy to nom nominate honorees for this award, they asked them to identify people who not only envisioned a brand new future, but were able to also frame the industry and societal needs and create solutions in a way that is uniquely their own. Equally important is the ability to recognize and develop talent and catalyze great teams. We ask for the legendary leader who has had enormous impact on the industry he or she served and through the contributions of the people they helped along the way. This year's legendary leader is someone who has been an institution in the Valley and the broader tech industry for over 40 years. In his current role as chairman of Microsoft, he helped the company through a critically important CEO transition as well as a major shift of Microsoft's business to the cloud. He is currently a venture partner at Lightspeed Ventures, a firm that invested in virtual instruments or VI, where he served as CEO. Before VI, this legendary leader had an incredible 10 year run as the CEO of Symantec, where he oversaw 10X revenue growth from 600 million to 6 billion and led the company through a diverse set of strategic shifts and transactions. Prior to Symantec, he spent 28 years at IBM, where he held multiple leadership roles in sales, marketing, and software development. From the beginning of his career to today, this individual has made incredible contributions on the forefront of technology to drive innovation forward. Perhaps most important is his mentorship of the countless others and his trademark transparent way of always pursuing the greater good. This is true leadership and someone whom I greatly admire. I always remember, and I told John this earlier, a chance interaction that I had with John about 10 years ago. Um, I had moved to the Valley like in late 2008, so this was early two, uh, 2009, and it was the first time my mom had come out to visit, first time she'd ever been to, to California, and we were at that little car wash on El Camino in Palo Alto. We were sitting there getting our car wash, and I'm with my mom, and I, I had just started doing a little bit of work with uh, your successor at Symantec, Enrique. And uh, I saw John sitting there and I said, I, I think that's John Thompson to my mom. So I went over and introduced myself, introduced my mom. And we, you know, we had a quick chat. It was, it was nothing spectacular, nothing special. It was, it was really friendly. We talked about an upcoming bike, bike trip that you had. And I always remember, and it made an impression on me, you know, the, the grace and generosity that you showed during that short, very short conversation. And, uh, you know, since then, my mom has been sending me little clips as, as she's followed John's career. Uh, so, John, did you see John's been promoted to uh, to be the chairman of Microsoft? Oh, did you see he selected Sadia Nadella to be the new CEO? So on the way over here tonight, I called my mom and I said, guess who I'm presenting the legendary leader award to in Silicon Valley? And she goes, well, that must be John Thompson. <laughs> it's the only tech executive she knows. and. <laughs> And so it is uh, with great pride um, that I am very honored to uh, present the Legendary Leader Award tonight to John Thompson on behalf of the Churchill Club and Accenture and my mom. <laughs> Joining him on stage for conversation will be Steve Lusco, former uh, CEO of Seagate. And uh, I'd ask you to come up to the stage. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Let's go to my hand. Look for any pictures, yes, and something. Hey, JT. Oh, hey, man. Good. <laughs> um, it's great to be here. Thank you, everyone, for hanging around. Thank you. And uh, thanks to the Churchill Club for recognizing my good friend John. And John, thanks for asking me to come and speak with you for a few minutes. I am a little upset that on that bio, though, nowhere is it mentioned that John was also on the Seagate board <laughs> and the one who talked me into coming back and running Seagate, but that's another story. John and I have known each other 20 years. Um, we've been good friends. We've served on boards together. And uh, to test his true leadership skills, he's also the godfather of our youngest, who 10 years from now is going to test all of his uh, competencies to That's the greatest sure. degree. <laughs> um, but John and I have spoken a lot about leadership over the years. We were on the search committee together, and obviously in the context of, of that um, task, we had to think a lot about leadership. And John, let's just talk uh, uh, to begin a little bit about your life in the context of leaders are born or leaders are made. Um, tell us a little about young John Thompson. Was he a, a born leader or was he a to be made leader? To be determined. <laughs> <laughs> well, I grew up in West Palm Beach, Florida. And notice the emphasis was on West Palm Beach, not Palm Beach. And it was in the 1950s and 60s. And so it was a very different world than the world we live in today. Uh, my father was a army guy, army and air force, ironically enough, who after that joined the postal service. And he was the first African-American letter carrier in Palm Beach County. But more importantly, he was a workaholic uh, because when he would come home from delivering mail after getting up at 4.30 in the morning to go start the day, he would then either trim the hedges, cut the yard, or in many instances, build duplexes. And he literally built from his own little money that he saved a half dozen or so little duplex apartments that he would rent to people throughout the community. And so the one thing that came from my father was this notion that um, hard work is what you do. You have to stay focused on executing if you want to move whatever your agenda is. And in that particular case, his agenda was all about economics for our family. In my mother's case, <laughs> In my mother's case, um, she was a school teacher. And she had a very simple view about life, which I, to this day, still subscribe to, which is life is about lifelong learning. And her notion was that you should be positioned where every day you learn something different. So that's why now some 47 years into my career in tech, I'm in chapter four of my career, where I'm actually a venture capitalist, as opposed to an operator, if you will. And all of that came from, candidly, my parents, who were, in fact, the motivators and the incentives for me to go and do the best I could, whatever that was. Uh, I can remember saying to my mom, gee, I don't know that I really want to do that. And she says, yes, you do. You just haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> Yep. And there were any number of occasions over the course of that period of time from 1949 to 1966, when I graduated from high school, where the two of them would share with me every day something for me to think about. Yeah, interesting time frame. I wanted to talk about that, you know, 49 to 66, you know, really your formative years were a time of amazing change um, in America, hopes and dreams that were, I think, articulated and challenged in ways that, you know, they, they hadn't been other than the massive effort of, of World War II. Any leaders that stand out in your mind from that time that um, even as a child resonated in terms of, you know, giving you hope, giving you inspiration and thinking, well, one day if I could be like that. Well, obviously the one person who will always stand out for any African-American from that era would be Martin Luther King. But more importantly, my mom grew up in a little town in Beechton, Georgia. It was about 35 miles from Tallahassee where she went to college. And ironically enough, 
uh, I would go every summer and spend the summer with my great grandmother there in Beechton while my mother would go to graduate school at Florida a and And my family was a very religious family. And I met this wonderful, wonderful young minister at a church in Beechton, Georgia, who ultimately became the sidekick to guess who. Wow. And lo and behold, over the years, while I haven't maintained the relationship in the last 10 or 15 years, but for many, many years from the time I met him to the time he became Martin Luther King's sidekick, we would communicate back and forth. So it was an interesting period. For yeah, life, uh, life throws these things in front of you, and a lot of it is luck. We've mentioned it a bunch tonight that um, you have to be open to see the luck. But right. you know, what, a, what about um, you know, the arc of your career, maybe just give the folks a bit of an understanding of um, when you entered tech. And I think we were talking before, you know, there's, there is this time that when you kind of later on become dinosaurs like John and I and um, people call you great leaders that, you know, you look back and you kind of think, when, when did that transition happen that maybe that seemed like it was a possibility because um, going into it, most of us never thought that. For you, you know, obviously you had a stellar career at IBM. And uh, at some point, it was you know clear that that you were something special, and and IBM recognized that. When did that hit you, and how did that feel, and how did it happen? Well, I, I think the the first big aha moment for me happened shortly after I joined the company, where a customer who was not my customer, but I was on a call with a fellow rep, said, "Don't ever bring him back here again." And the reason he didn't want me there ever again was because of the color of my skin. And the big fear I had at that time as I turned to the branch manager and said, look, I've got to feed my family based upon selling stuff to small businesses like this. And if I can't feed my family, then I don't know that I need this job. Well, I literally got accelerated in my career within days where I went from the typical, you sell new accounts to mid-size accounts to large accounts, I went immediately to selling to large accounts. And in a very short period of time, I went from selling to large accounts to a regional staff job, which I just didn't envision. But the real moment for me was the realization that I don't fit in here. I had been there for about five or six years, and I didn't look like any other IBM in the office. And it had nothing to do with the color of my skin. It had everything to do with my two sister suits, Polly and Esther. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that I just didn't believe in the culture of idea. The blue suit, white shirt, you know, wingtip shoes, I just did not believe in that. And one day I was sitting in the staff office on the regional staff or district staff, and I looked around and I realized, holy smokes, I don't look like anybody here. And again, it had nothing to do with the color of my skin. It had everything to do with the fact that I was misaligned culturally with where the company was, that I had not embraced who the company was and what it expected of its employees. And I thought, gee, if, if I'm not willing to do that, then it's time for me to leave. And I decided, okay, I better go all in. And I became a Brooks Brothers model because that's where Everybody from IBM bought all their crap at Brooks Brothers. So I got the tassel loafers and the button-down shirts and all that stuff. And, and before too long, I mean, my career just literally took off. It had to do with my, <laughs> had everything to do with my shirts and shoes, uh, I guess. I started just so back this too late, I guess. Um, what about um, leadership? Um, different people have different words. Tell me how you think of leadership, if you had to summarize it in you know, a word, a sentence, um, what would it be? Well, I mean, everybody thinks of a leader as someone who has this incredible vision and view of the world and the company and what have you. And I think that's foundational for every leader. You've got to have a point of view about what you want your organization or your company to do or be. But I think the real attributes of leaders are about who they are as individuals. What's their integrity? What's their openness? What's their candor? How hard are they willing to work? How hard do they push you or me to do what we're supposed to do? That's what real leaders do. And while they have to have a vision for the organization, 
more importantly, they have to be about execution. They have to be about all the things that create success or the lack thereof. And oh, by the way, when they discover that there has been a lack thereof, what do we do to fix that? What do we do to modify the path that we're on such that the outcome for the company is different than it might have been had we not done anything? And so I am all about, and have been for my entire career, all about focus and execution, because that's what real leaders do. They focus on the end result, and they execute maniacally until they get there. So in the context of being chairman at Microsoft, obviously, that main job is more to do with constituencies. Nothing. You, don't do, you don't do nothing. Yeah, you don't, yeah. Organizing board <laughs> meetings, uh, managing wild board members, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Steve used to be on the Microsoft. But... Um, <laughs> The um, but obviously in the case of you know Sacha um, being a first-time CEO at arguably the largest and most important company in the world in technology, um, or at least one of the top three, um, your role there obviously had to also become a mentor to Satya. Um, how was that initially, and how's that evolved as you know he's emerged to to really I think be one of the truly great leaders in technology yeah, in sure. a short order of time. Well, I, when I was first approached about being chairman, as you well know, I, had, I said no. I uh, really had no interest because it's kind of hard to think about being chairman of the board of a company called Microsoft when you've got Bill in one chair and Steve in the other chair. Not this Steve. Not, not this Steve, <laughs> Steve Ballmer. And, and so my response was no. And then they came back and ask again and they ask again. And then I realized, you know, we are making a big bet here with Satya and I really don't know who the chair would be if we chose someone else because it wasn't someone who was on the current board. And so maybe, maybe I ought to take a personal risk and do this as the chairman of the board so I can help coach Satya. And sure enough, the conversation he and I had was, look, you and I don't really know each other that well. Yes, we met each other over the last couple of years as you run the, the cloud business. But oh, by the way, that's not quite the relationship we need if I'm going to be chair and you're going to be CEO. So let's figure out what the path would be to build a relationship, not to build a business, but to build a relationship between the two of us. So you trust me and I trust you and that we can operate truly as a team guiding Microsoft into the future. And sure enough, for the first, I'd say year or so, and I think I've said this many times, the first year or so, we would talk almost every Saturday morning for about an hour. It would run anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour, depending upon what the topic was. And the topic was always his, never mind, mm -hmm. because it was always about me doing whatever I could to coach or advise or mentor Satya because I had spent so many years as a CEO of a company, not nearly the size of Microsoft by any stretch, but certainly a public company. And that was something that he'd never done before, which was run a public company. Great. Um, we've mentioned a couple of times the business roundtable um, awakening on uh, broader constituencies. And yet it was interesting because I think every recipient of award tonight mentioned their dedication to customers. Um, clearly, uh, if not directly stated their dedication to their employees, um, their communities. Carl mentioned, you know, things that David Packard and Lou Platt said 50 years ago or 60 years ago, Al Shugart built Seagate the same way. And yet somehow there's this, you know, feeling of all of a sudden corporations have waken up to a wider aperture of understanding it's, it's more than shareholders. And in the same time, we've had a fairly significant backlash against technology. Right. Um, do you, how do you perceive the responsibilities? Do you think tech maybe is different than um, some of the other corporations that seem to now be including this, or do you think it's just perception? Uh, and then I have a couple follow-on questions. But first, let's start with the, the basic one of, do you really think anything has changed or? Well, many things have changed. I mean, if you think about it, we use more technology today than ever before in our lives. And it's every minute of our lives almost because of this mobile device thing that has become so relevant. And from that has spawned many, many, many applications and therefore it's created, created more and more data or content. And that content is what has become critical to 
to every organization on the planet, regardless of whether or not you're Facebook or Google, or if you're, <coughs> candidly, Lightspeed, because it's your insights from that data that will allow you to drive something different or something new. My sense is that the industry is going to go through some regulatory change. Um, you cannot have as much data content, as much privacy issues, as many security issues without the industry being advised on how it should behave and how it should manage itself. My fear, however, is that the, the pendulum will swing too far to the right or left from where we are today. And that would be devastating in the face of China with 50,000 engineers produced per year per college and are out of every college. And China, I'm sorry, the US 50,000, China 1 million. So if you believe that that ratio is going to maintain for many, many years to come, boy, we're in tough shape if we do too far in terms of leaning right or left on regulatory oversight, because that's not what China's going to do, that's for sure. Yeah, and you know, I think it's, it's interesting when you look at the leadership position that Microsoft has taken um, on, on really four significant vectors, right? I mean, there's Satya, who clearly has been vocal about this. Um, Brad Smith, who I think is coming here next week, has been, you know, I think Very one good. of the real thought leaders on, on uh, personal privacy. Uh, Bill, of course, in, in the Bill's blogs, he talks about machine learning and, and the responsibilities of privacy, and obviously you as, as chairman. Is it a coordinated thing, or is it is it just that, you know, you, you have the similar mindset based on your fundamental integrity um, that, that this message is kind of so consistent and, and really, I think, strikingly different um, from Microsoft in a, in a really positive way? Well, I, I think what is very true about Microsoft is it is an enterprise software company. It's not a consumer software company. And while we have a wonderful search business, it generates great profit for the company. And we have an interesting gaming business that generates great revenue and great profit for the company. In the scheme of things, they are probably 10, 20% of the company's revenue. And therefore, the balance of it comes from large enterprises. Success with large enterprise customers from the many years I've been in this business is all about one, a relationship, and two, a sense of trust and integrity. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do things with your products that they trust or that they feel they can trust, that is not in your best interest. And I think Microsoft got lucky, quite frankly, because they did not have the degree of success that they wanted in the consumer space. And had they been in the consumer space, they might be making some of the same silly mistakes that some of the current incumbents are making today. And that would be catastrophic for the company. One last question, John. Um, what would be a, a challenge that you would leave to, to the audience tonight uh, in terms of some of these things you mentioned, in terms of the impact technology is having on us, weaving in some of the things that Carl's talked about in terms of uh, what is a community and what is a community supposed to do together to solve problems and, and from the younger entrepreneurs, if I can characterize that way, just the excitement and enthusiasm. And by the way, Slack and Zoom, you know, and I'm Amazing. not excluding Amazing Peloton companies. for any other reason, but uh, Slack and Zoom just to me, like life-changing products. Like, what would your challenge be to, and so is Peloton, by the way. Um, but, and my wife, though, wants to get rid of my bike because she wants the running machine thing. So it's like, it's a, it's a battle at home, which obviously she'll win. Um, but uh, <laughs> but um, what would be the one challenge you'd leave? Well, I think all of us as leaders have to have a sense of confidence in ourselves. But it should not be visible to the rest of the world because it looks, if you're not careful, like arrogance. And unfortunately, in the tech space, that's too prompt. Too many of us have a view or have an image that is one of arrogance and obnoxiousness, not brilliance. Ironically enough, I can remember when I was in college going to my first data processing class. It's called the Introduction to Data Processing. It was from 6 o'clock till 9 o'clock, two days a week. And after about eight or nine weeks, I finally said, I ain't doing this anymore. This is horrible. <laughs> so I dropped out. And I vowed I'd never do tech again. Never, ever. And when the opportunity came along to join IBM, 
fraternity brother of mine ran outplacement services and came to me and he says, you need to go and interview with IBM. They're looking for salespeople. You should go. I went, look at me. I got an 800 pound Afro. I got <laughs> striped pants and two tone shoes. Polyester I mean, suit, apparently. Polyester <laughs> shirts. I mean, how could I ever do that? Had I not listened to him, life would be very different for my family today, for sure. And the whole idea is, even when you don't like something, maybe, maybe you just have to kind of pull your nose, suck it up, and go learn what you can learn. Because if you believe as I do in what my mom said, which is life is about lifelong learning, then learning about data processing at that point in my life was critical to the rest of my life. What I didn't understand, quite frankly, was it was going to be as impactful over time as it has become. Great. No question. About yeah, that. the uh, humility is interesting. Is uh, I remember Shugart was good friends with Charles Schultz, and uh, and you know who was obviously the creator of Snoopy uh, Peanuts, uh, but he's also a great satirist. And one of his great cartoons that Al had framed in his office was of Snoopy sitting up on his doghouse and said, "It's hard to be humble when you're great." Um, <laughs> anyway, so John, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.